Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program that is particularly designed uh, and totally designed to only focus our eyes or to focus our eyes on only one place, one book, and that is the Bible. How marvelous, how wonderful it is that God has given us the Bible. We don't really appreciate this at all until we begin to realize that everything in the future hinges on how we look at the Bible. Because every human being does have a future, whether we like it or not. Death is not the end. The end of the world is not the end. There is something that goes on forevermore after that. And the Bible is the only place in the whole world where we can know anything about that. And what that is, is that there is uh, hereafter where the those who have uh, been reconciled to God in some way. Why do I say reconciled to God? Because by nature we're in rebellion against God. We want our way. We want to do our thing. And yet God is our king. He is the God whom we have to answer to. And when we disobey God, when we do our thing, we are in rebellion. And the law of God, that God himself has laid down, and God himself has to follow through on that law, calls for the most terrible punishment, eternal damnation, to be spent eternity future in a dreadful place called hell, which is also called the lake of fire, to underscore the awfulness of that existence in hell where we must make payment for sins, and that payment will never be completed because it is forevermore. And yet, uh, the Bible offers that wonderful, wonderful uh, other side of the coin, namely that there is salvation for many, that Christ came uh, to pay for the sins of those that he chose. We don't know who they are. We have no idea who the, the ones that God has elected to salvation until someone actually does become saved. Then he becomes increased or she becomes increasingly aware that she or he has become a child of God. Glory be. Then it is heaven forevermore rather than hell forevermore. Now we have a a listener in Tanzania. We get quite a few letters from Tanzania. It's a country in Africa. And this uh, letter is uh, speaking to a very important problem. Uh, By reading the Old and the New Testaments, which one is correct and which one should we follow? Now, this is a very practical question because in all kinds of churches, there has been very seriously taught the idea, oh, well, the Old Testament, that was for Old Testament Israel. We don't have to pay much attention to that. Really, the part we have to pay attention to is the New Testament. And therefore, lots of times when people say, oh, we've been giving Bibles out, what they mean by that is they were just giving the New Testament out. Now, it's true that we can have any part of the Bible, and God can work that through that to save someone. But on the other hand, God commands us. He commands the whole human race to be obedient to the Bible. And when God is talking about obedience to the Bible, he's not talking about just the New Testament or just the Old Testament. He's talking about the whole Bible. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and correction and uh, reproof and training in righteousness. Fact is, we can't really understand many parts of the New Testament without also reading the Old Testament. The New Testament talks about Adam, talks about Abraham, talks about Melchizedek, talks about creation. 
uh, how in the world can we learn about those uh, statements unless we read the Old Testament where God gives a lot of information about creation and Adam and uh, and about uh, Abraham and Melchizedek and so on. And uh, likewise, we can't understand the New Test, the Old Testament unless we have the New Testament. The Bible talks in the Old Testament about a coming Messiah. It talks about a burnt offering, a blood sacrifice, anticipating a coming uh, Savior. And yet, who is that Savior? How did he come? What can we know about him? We can't have the full detail that God wants us to have unless we also read the New Testament. And so you see, the Bible is one book. One book. It is one word. And there are no contradictions. Oh, there are many apparent contradictions, but they are not real contradictions. Anytime you see an apparent con contradiction, it simply means that you have to do more studying and more comparing Scripture with Scripture, and more humble praying, Oh, God, I don't understand. Oh, can it be you might open my spiritual eyes so I might begin to understand. And, and uh, once we, uh, again and again, we find that an apparent contradiction melts away, and we find instead it was really keeping hidden a very beautiful truth of some kind, then we know, yes, that's the way God wrote the Bible. For those who are doubters, for those who are not wanting to really uh, trust the whole Bible, uh, for them, it leaves them in unbelief. They think they can uh, conclude to themselves, thinking they're doing this very honestly, huh, I can't trust the Bible at all. Look at this contradiction here and there. How in the world could uh, God... Uh, have written the Bible, putting in these with these contradictions. It's obviously it's the work of men, and, and uh, whoever collated all their works uh, did not even check it through to uh, to make correction of these contradictions. And uh, but on the other hand, and so they're left in their unbelief. But on the other hand, those who approach the Bible. You know, it is the work of God. Everything in the Bible, in the original languages, is altogether perfect and trustworthy. It's only that our minds are very finite, our understanding is very limited, and it only means that we have to do more research in the Word of God, not in theological books, but in the Word of God. And as we compare Scripture with Scripture and pray for wisdom, yes, yes, again and again, we'll find that that contradiction uh, is not there at all. It is completely gone. Well, thank you, Tanzania, for that question. Uh, and now shall we go to our first caller tonight on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, good evening. Oh, hello, Mr. Campton. How are you? Very well, thank um, you. Um, I hope you had a wonderful holiday. Um, I'm in the New York area in Long Island, and I don't know what happened to my channel. I can't hear family radio. I've been worried all day. I just can't get it. Uh, let me explain. We must have had a lightning strike where we don't know for sure if this was the reason, but it probably happened, that maybe a couple of months ago our transmission line, that, that's a, a big line, an electric line that goes from our transmitter up to the antenna that's on top of the tower. And, right. And it was must have been struck by a lightning strike which... I uh, didn't put it out of commission, but uh, in the ensuing time between now and then, between then and now, uh, the line weakened and weakened until finally, sometime this early this morning, it completely uh, went out of commission. And so we are now uh, preparing to put in a new transmission line. Hopefully, it will be delivered tomorrow morning. And hopefully, uh, hopefully, maybe by tomorrow night, it will be installed. But it's a major undertaking that we're working very, very hard on okay. to repair. 
Well, thank you so much because that is, I never turn it off. It's, I don't watch TV. I don't go to church. That's my inspiration, my Bible and family radio. So I was, it's like I lost a friend all day. I'm walking around crazy. And I said, I have to find out what, what happened. So I yeah. thank you so much. Right. And I hope that everything will go well. And God bless you all the best for 2007. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. I'd like to ask you two questions, two quick questions here. The first one is I'd like to know why you believe having Jesus, or say the Last Supper, any type of images, any type of pictures of Jesus, you think it's wrong? Well, I, because the Bible itself instructs us in Exodus 20, and we, we uh, man didn't write the Bible. This is right from the mouth of God, where God says, Thou shalt not make any image of, of anything in heaven or, or the earth beneath that we bow down to. And Jesus is eternal God. He came from heaven. And therefore we are, and, an, and you can make an image, a three-dimensional image, that would be a statute. Or you can make a two-dimensional image, that's a picture. And so either would be a violation, a gross violation of the word of the law that God has laid down. For more than that, nobody knows what Jesus looked like. There are no portraits of, that anyone took of Jesus when he lived. And so whatever is in that portrait is a big fat lie anyway, because that isn't what, way, way, what Jesus looked like, whatever is painted there. But even, but the worst part of it is, is that it is a violation of the law of God. And so, uh, we, we, uh, you know, the people can say, oh, what a beautiful painting, or what about a beautiful this, or like the writing, or like the, the, uh, the uh, pictures on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel uh, in uh, Italy, uh, uh, that sh they are pictures presumably of God, and that should never, never, never have been done. It is altogether an abomination, uh, even though in the minds of men it can look significant or beautiful, but that's because we are trying to follow our own rules rather than God's rules. Okay. My second question is, is, they say in the Bible, Jesus is Jewish. Now, why wouldn't you follow the Jesus faith? Meanwhile, everyone looks up to Jesus, the Savior, and why wouldn't you want to follow, you can't follow in his footsteps, but why wouldn't you want to follow that type of faith? Well, the, so fact is, the fact is that... Uh, Jesus had to come from some nation. He had to be born in somebody's family because he had to be, he had to have receive a human nature in order to be a, a candidate to make payment for man's sins, the sins of all those that Christ came to save. And it happened to be the little nation of Israel. Now that was, that nation, uh, doesn't have any, any special uh, position in God's sight today. It, it, it is not a special nation of any kind. Uh, it was a nation that for, uh, t uh, t for a period of, uh, of, uh, quite a long period, uh, God used, uh, uh, to represent the king, externally represent the kingdom of God in heaven. But for the last 2,000 years, it doesn't represent anything. Uh, 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 the, uh, it's the local congregations that represent, externally represent the kingdom of God, and they're found all through the world amongst every nation of the world. So whether Jew Jesus originally was Chinese or Jewish or, or uh, Arabian or whatever it was, it wouldn't have made any difference. He had to take on a human nature, and it happened to be that God did put, pick the nation of national Israel. Okay, thank you for taking my call. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, um, good night. Is that um, a campaign? Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay. I am. I, w I would like to ask you a question. I don't know if the, the 
the, the radio station, if it's out of order, I'm not hearing it. Uh, you would like to know which? No, I would like to know if there's a problem with the radio station. Oh, the problem, yeah, at WFME, I, I think I'll be explaining this a number of times tonight. Uh, the, the fact is we had our, we must have had a lightning strike uh, a couple of months ago on our antenna, on our transmission line that goes up to our antenna. That's a very several hundred feet long, all the way up the tower to our antenna near the top. And it finally it completely uh, stopped being uh, being able to be used, and so we're with great haste, uh, working as fast as we can, uh, replacing that antenna, that transmission line. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, because I was trying today to listen to the program, and uh, it, yeah. I tried everything, and there was nothing. So I said, oh, "Let me call." Yeah, yeah. it will I know tell you. It just you just have to be patient that uh, all may go well and that we'll hopefully be back on the air maybe by tomorrow night. Okay. Thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Brother Catherine. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, why God created uh, uh, human beings with special needs. Why Why did he create human beings with special needs? Yes. Well, you said that correctly, of course, because in Exodus chapter 4, God explains that who made man to see or, or blind or, or whatever, and it is God who is in charge of all of that, and and... Uh, the problem is that God created man perfect at the beginning, and all of us in principle were in the loins of Adam. Right. But then when mankind rebelled against God, this was not God's action, it was man's action, they rebelled against God, and they became spiritually dead. Now, uh, following that, God cursed this creation because mankind had been assigned the task of ruling over this creation, and you you then would have a cursed ruler ruling over a perfect world, and so God also made the world itself subject to uh, corruption, so that we have uh, poisonous viruses and bacteria and uh, poisonous snakes and and carnivorous animals and so on. Uh, 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 it's a pro it's a product of the fact that mankind rebelled against God. Now, eventually, this also weakened the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, physical structure of man. It's, it gets into our DNA. It gets into our the very essence of our being, and so uh, people are born. Uh, where, that are crippled in their mind or crippled in their in their some part of their body, and and so God takes full responsibility for that, in the sense that uh, it is because because mankind rebelled against God, and so God had to also bring this world itself under the curse. Uh, of uh, of corruption, and that in turn would um, um, therefore make it de uh, develop it in a way that there would be cripples being born and so on. And uh, yet God also used that uses that as an opportunity, because it here is a special child that is born to a family, and that family now uh, can realize their. Uh, opportunity and responsibility to especially care for that special child that re needs enormous care. Now, can can people with special needs receive salvation? Oh, the, it has no bearing on salvation. God is not a respecter of persons. That person with a crippled mind, so that they never got past the uh, the ability to think beyond a one-year-old or a six-month-old baby, can be saved just as readily as someone with a perfect mind or a, a fine mind. Uh, it, it, uh, if they're under the hearing of the Word of God, and if God intends to save them, if He if He named them, remember He named 
the, all those he planned to save even before he ever created mankind, and and he will follow through on that. It, it, it does not inhibit in any way someone's opportunity for salvation. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you, you so for, much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping? Yes. I have a question. If, uh, if God only chose a few to be saved and their sins are paid for, then what is the purpose of Judgment Day? Uh, if, if uh, you, insofar as the true believers, that Judgment Day was very real in that Christ had to be our substitute in being judged for the sins of those whom he came to save. Uh, you see, we have, to, we have to back up and start at the beginning. Christ is uh, a, a, a righteous God, and he has laid out the law of God. The whole Bible is the law of God. And God himself is under that law, just as we are under that law. God does not have two sets of laws, one for God and one for man. We are created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. We're under exactly the same law that God is under. Now, that law stipulates that in the moment someone rebels against God, who is the creator of mankind, then there must be a payment, no different than the law of our country, that if you rebel against the law of, of the land, if you uh, d disobey that law, then you will be brought to judgment, and if you're found guilty, there will be a penalty that has to be paid. It's very parallel. Okay. Right, wait, 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 so, that, oh, oh. I'm sorry? Well, you're saying that Jesus, when he died for the people he came to save, he set them free, right? He, I mean, if he, he set them free, then why should they come into judgment? He, Jesus himself, in order to to make to have a person uh, to, with him eternally in heaven, had to find a someone. Either that person himself would have to spend an eternity in hell, which is forevermore, and he'd never get out of it, in an attempt to pay for his sins, because uh, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, sin applies to every single human being. Or Christ would have to find a substitute, someone who was uh, legally qualified to take the place of that person's suffering. And the only one that was found qualified to pay for that, uh, to take the place, was Christ himself, who is God, provided that he would also take on a human nature, so he would be one of us. So he had to be born as a baby with a human nature. And so as God as well as man, he, uh, God poured out upon him the equivalent punishment that would have to be endured by all those that Christ came to save. And only because he is infinite God could that punishment be so intensified that in the hours of the atonement from the time he was in the Garden of Gethsemane till the time when he, as he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. A God could so intensify that punishment that it became equivalent to all of these individuals he had come to save, spending an eternity in hell and coming out at the other end. And so, uh, therefore, because he made the full payment demanded by the law on behalf of those he came to save, now he is in a position to forgive them and 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 to claim them for his own, to give them a new resurrected soul and later on on the last day a new resurrected body so that eternally we will be perfect with Christ forevermore. But you see, the, uh, the judgment process had to be fully and meticulously followed through all the way. Now those who who's have not been named by God to become saved 
uh, they don't have anyone to be their substitute, and so they will have to take their turn at the judgment throne on the last day and will be found guilty, and they themselves will have to spend eternity in hell. And that's why, that's why we are so urgently sending the gospel into the world, because through, it is through the word of God that Christ is gathering in all those that he had made plans to save. Okay, well, I, I agree with most of what you're saying, and I'm aware of what the Bible says. But I have one more question for you. Um, why did God originally create hell? Well, actually, hell is not, a, is not made yet. But hell, uh, the, the essence of hell, is to be under the wrath of God. Uh, and, and the moment mankind sinned, or, and the angels sinned, uh, L- Lucifer was the leader uh, who became Satan, when they sinned, uh, they came under the wrath of God, so hell uh, came into existence, not as a place, but as a condition of being under the wrath of God. That's where God finds us when he saves us. We, every human being before he is saved is in hell, not in a place called hell, but they're under the wrath of God because of their sins. That's why we read in Ephesians chapter 4 that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth, which is a figure of hell or being under the wrath of God, and brought forth captivity captive. That is, Christ endured the wrath of God, only he did so uh, in an eternal way, uh, and, and, uh, and brought forth out of hell those that he had paid, whose sins he had paid for, and so were no longer identified with hell. Now, on the other hand, the unsaved, who are presently under the wrath of God, are not formally charged yet. They have not been uh, uh, legally found guilty uh, and sentence has not been passed. But when they stand at the judgment throne on the last day, then they will be formally charged and sentence will be passed uh, uh, to spend an eternity in hell. Then God will have to make it a place simply because he has other purposes for this present earth. Uh, It's it's going to be uh, re- uh, destroyed and redesigned as a new heaven and a new earth and so he has to find a place for the unsaved which is called hell but I'm going to pause for this message we're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hi Mr. Camping yeah. um, I had a question about the word Temple. When I see the word temple show up in the in the Bible, is there a deeper spiritual significance that I should I, I'm be aware sorry, of? I'm sorry, your voice falls away. Could you speak up right in, speak right into your phone, please? Okay, I'm sorry. I I was curious about the word temple. Um, it shows up more than once, and I'm wondering if there's a spiritual significance that I could um, that that you know just might have have a deeper significance than, you know, just what right, it right. appears to mean. Uh, what, what is the word that you're curious about? Say it very slowly. Uh, the word temple. T-E-M-P-L-E. Tem- yeah, temple. Temple. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the word temple is used in the Old Testament about the temple, for example, that Solomon built. It was a place, and it that temple was uh, the most holy building in the most holy city, Jerusalem, and it was representative of the whole body of believers that would become part of the kingdom of God externally throughout the New Testament, because in the New Testament, God picks up on the idea of the temple. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says the foundation of that temple is the Lord Jesus, and we who uh, join up in the churches, uh, become members of churches, we are building blocks in those in that temple, we're either, we are either gold, silver, or precious stones, that is, we are true believers, or we're wood, hay, stubble, we look like we are 
true believers, but we really are not. And, uh, and that is, uh, was typified by the temple that, uh, that Solomon built in the Old Testament. And it's a spiritual temple. It's, it, it is uh, uh, throughout the church age, all the churches externally represented the kingdom of God, which, in, which uh, the kingdom of God again was represented by the temple. Wow. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And, then, you know, that's one of the reasons we have to read the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we have to compare Scripture with Scripture. We have to remember the rule that Christ spoke in parables. That is, we have to look for spiritual meaning. And so it is a... Uh, it, it takes a lot of careful reading and prayer and uh, praying for guidance from the Holy Spirit and and uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture until finally we can see the cohesiveness and the unity of all these various expressions, how they all begin to tie together. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Uh, yes, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I got a question. Um, if God knows everything from beginning to end, and then what's the point of him doing it? What's the point of him going through the motions? Well, the point is that, every, you know, this is God's program not our program and we don't fully understand god of course in our little feeble human minds we how can we know uh, what's going on in the infinite pure perfect mind of god who is able to speak for example and and create this whole beautiful universe as intricate and as complex as it is as it is how in the world can we really understand the mind of god but we do know that through all this, uh, God does state it is all together for his glory. Now, uh, we get a little bit of a sense of, uh, of, what, how, of what is going on when we look at Ephesians chapter 3. There's a very interesting verse there in Ephesians chapter 3 where God says in verse 10, and this is right from the mouth of God, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in the heavenlies, and who are these? We must remember, the Bible teaches that God is from everlasting. He has no beginning. We know this universe had a beginning about 13,000 years ago. What was God doing in all the eons of time in eternity past? He certainly, we don't have to feel for a moment, he was sitting on his hands. Uh, there were other things that he had created and, and uh, other things that he doesn't speak about uh, in the Bible at all. Except there's at least a, a hint here that there are other principalities and powers that that in the heavenlies, that they might, that the things that are happening here might be known to them by the church. That is, by not by the the external local congregations, but by the eternal a church made up of all those who are the true believers, and through what he's doing for them, the manifold wisdom of God might be seen. Now, uh, we, can, we can illustrate this this way. Uh, it's one thing to say uh, God is a God of justice. All right, that's a true statement. It's another thing to say God is a God of justice, and he has demonstrated this in fantastic fashion as he himself, uh, in order to satisfy the law of God, May, paid the penalty for the sins of those he came to save. That is demonstrating justice beyond any way of just uh, uh, knowing about it by saying it. God is a God of patience. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. God is a God of wrath. 
All the attributes of God shine through in glowing colors, as uh, so to speak, as we see God demonstrate these things as he develops his whole plan that he developed here for the uh, produce for this planet Earth. And, and I, I believe that in this way, God has glorified himself tremendously so that all in the eons of time or eons of eternity would be better to say of time past and future uh, can be seen exactly what a marvelous, what a tremendous God God is. That's why we do know the Bible say, says we are saved to the praise of his glory. When Jesus was born, the, the shepherds in the field uh, heard the heavenly host singing. They were the angels from heaven. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace, goodwill to, toward men. The whole business of planet earth and its salvation program uh, and mankind and their salvation program all ultimately brings glory to God. And that's as far as we can go with it. Okay, one more question. In all the stuff, Earth and Mars and galaxies, all the things that God created, are we Earthlings to, or planet Earth his only creation? Is there other beings somewhere else in the galaxies that he created? Or are we the only ones? No, you see, we, I, uh, we, when we search the Bible, we find, first of all, that the galaxies out there, the uh, the uh, uh, all the uh, suns and the and the planets and so on were all created 13,000 years ago. Now we don't we don't have any idea of an infinite God, uh, but here on the one hand, God can create matter so that no matter how much. Uh, mankind investigates the smallest particle and there's always something more that he finds something more that he finds uh, because of the intricate way in which God has created the electrons and the neutrons and the protons and and all the other uh, elements that make up matter and uh, and uh, there's just no end it's just and and everything uh, this is why in modern communication for example it all uh, it boils down to getting into smaller and smaller units, but it was it, they, mankind can only do that because God originally created it that way. But the same God, and when we turn the te the, to the uh, telescope or the microscope around and look the other way, we see have a telescope, and we look out there and we go billions of light years into space, and we see galaxy after galaxy of, of stars, billions of stars, and. And it's the same God who spoke and brought all of that into being. Now, that didn't require time either because he is an infinite God. We, we can't really understand this because our, we're, we, are, we can only think in terms of finite uh, time and finite uh, size and so on. But with God, that, there's no limit. He is an infinite God. And so... Uh, and so we immediately think, well, then maybe there's some people on Mars or on some other planet out there. No, that is, that, there's nothing in the Bible, not anything in the Bible that suggests that. Here is the center of the whole activity, planet Earth. Here is where Christ created mankind in his image as a crown of his creation. Here is where Christ came as a baby in order to be the, uh, the uh, savior of mankind and so on. This is where the, the the intense activity goes on. But from here, we we go either going through our uh, electronic microscope and so on, looking at smaller and smaller and smaller uh, pieces of matter, or we look through our telescope and and look further and further out into space. But it's only giving God the glory. But the real activity is right here on planet Earth. Okay. And, okay. One final question. In Genesis, when it said God created the Earth and the stars and the animals, he said, let there be, and it was. But yeah. when he got to man, he said, let us make man. 
who was he talking to as if he needed some help or something? He because. said, let there be, and everything was. But when he got to man, he said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Who was he talking to, and why did he need help? Or Well, or, the fact is, when we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word God is a plural word. Uh, 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 so that we could properly say in the beginning, God's created the heaven and the earth. Yet, uh, on the other hand, the Bible insists there is one God. Uh, but you see, God, this again is the mystery of God. We are little minds, tiny, tiny little minds, while they're patterned somewhat after the mind of God, yet they are so limited compared with the infinite mind of God. So we can't begin to understand God. But when he, when we search the Bible, we do know God insists there is one God. Yet he also insists there's God the Father, there's God the Lord Jesus Christ, there's God the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, they are uh, presented to us as three distinct persons. And we can't reconcile that. We have no way of reconciling that because our little finite minds were not designed to understand an infinite God. We simply accept that. And as that's why he said, for example, in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image. He's following through what he said in uh, Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God's created the heaven and the earth, and yet there is one God, uh, he insists, in other places. And so we just leave it alone. I don't understand, but I know that that God is God, and that's and, and uh, uh, the word God is a singular word, and yet uh, uh, so there's one God. But we we just have to uh, accept what the Bible says and say, Oh Lord, there there are certain things we are unable to understand. In the in the eternity future, when we come to the end of this world in a few years, yes, then we will have more understanding, I'm sure. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Camping? Yes. I was listening, um, and earlier, a few calls back, uh, there was a gentleman that was asking why Christ came as, um, in the Jewish nation. Yes. And I recall reading somewhere in the Bible, and I, it might, I, I'm thinking it's probably the New Testament, where there's a definition of a Jew is someone with a circumcision of heart. And I thought that was a perfect reason why he was Jewish. Well, God used, you know, you must remember that, uh, uh, first of all, there was no Jewish nation before 4,000 years ago. Uh, when Abraham, who is the beginning of the Jewish nation, uh, uh, came to the land of Canaan, he was a Babylonian. He came from Ur of the Chaldees, and Chaldees is a synonym for Babylon. So he was a heathen. He was not a Jew. There didn't exist a Jew. And so out of the world, out of Babylon, so to speak, God carved a tiny little nation beginning with Abraham. And, and that nation became a, uh, the progenitor of the Lord Jesus and became a type or picture of everyone who becomes a true believer. Well, all of us are part of the whole world, of the dominion of Satan. And yet we're carved out of the... Uh, we're taken out of the dominion of Satan into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the Jewish nation came out of Babylon, or as Abraham came out of Babylon. And that's why Abraham is also called the father of all believers. Yes. But thank you for sharing you. That, that, uh, that verse. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good, yes, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, brother. Camping, good evening. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Um, 
What would you uh, tell people that would, would say uh, that you uh, would limit the Lord when you say that uh, he's not, he doesn't bring any revelation anymore? Now, will you repeat that and speak a little more slowly so I can follow you? Say, say. Well, uh, you use uh, the book of Revelation, uh, sir, that uh, the Lord is no longer bringing revelation anymore. Oh. He doesn't speak to us anymore Well, but, outside the Bible. Well, but you see, that is an enormous blessing, an enormous blessing. Because just try to imagine a world, and it would be chaos, but imagine a world where, where God was still bringing divine revelation. And so you heard about someone in Indonesia who received a message from God, and uh, then you heard about someone in France who received a message from God. And how are you going to retrieve all of these messages? Worse than that, way worse than that, the Bible teaches that, that uh, and, and we know also in practice, that Satan is permitted to uh, speak supernaturally today through Ouija boards and through tarot cards and through signs and wonders and, and visions and so on. How would you know whether that message this person in Indonesia received was from Satan or was it from God? And we would have utter chaos. We would, but you know, God, when He finished the Bible about 1900 years ago, He said, it came to the last chapter uh, of the Bible, right near the end of the chapter, and he says, Now, if anyone adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add to him the plagues written herein. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, I will take away his share in the tree of life. Wow! Wow! That was an enormous blessing because now we have the message from God secure. We know when we're reading the Bible, it is not from Satan. We know it's from God. We know we have the whole word of God. We don't have to be looking around. Is there something more that God wants to say to us? We don't have to be afraid of being tricked by Satan. All we have to do is follow the rules that God himself has laid down in the Bible as to how we are to read the Bible. And, uh, and that is an enormous blessing that God has given us. But uh, what, uh, how can I answer uh, when, they, when uh, my friends, you know, I, I've been listening for you. I've been listening uh, for a long time. I kind of, you know, um, trust what, what you say. I believe it in my heart, you know, it is true. But they, um, then I get response like you say, you know, when you do this, like you're trying to uh, limit the, uh, God, you know, like, you know, what? God is from everlasting and to everlasting. I mean, uh, yeah. Brother Camping, you you are speaking to us now from the Lord. Isn't that like the Lord is bringing revelation right now? You see, uh, you, you see, the problem is that they do not want what God says. They want what they want. In other words, they're coming to the Bible and insisting we know more than God. And and they don't realize the trap that they're setting up for themselves because they, uh, they, they haven't read the Bible carefully. That Satan, for example, that we read in 2 Corinthians 11, right from the mouth of God, that Satan comes as an angel of light and his messengers as messengers of righteousness. And uh, they... They don't, they don't understand this, that, the, that Satan counterfeits the Bible all the time, counterfeits the Word of God. And so they may think that they're not limiting God. They are, they are, they are wide open to whatever God says. They don't realize that God has, has limited His Word to the Bible for our protection so that Satan cannot con us uh, by coming as in, uh, through some other supernatural message of some kind. Uh, they, 
in their blindness, uh, in their pride, in their ego, thinking that they know more than God. They can design God the way they want God to be. They have set themselves up for destruction. I, um, I also, okay, uh, well, camping, uh, last thing, sir. Um, I've been told that the book of Revelation was not uh, the, the last book written. Is that true? Well, the fact, you know, uh, there are those who argue, well, no, uh, John was written after Revelation or whatever. Uh, but uh, where are they getting their information? They're not getting their information from the Bible. They're getting their information from what somebody wrote at some point. And, and anything that somebody wrote about the Bible or what they thought is not trustworthy. The Bible is the only trustworthy book. And when it says we're not to add to the to the uh, words of this book, well, the book the the book of Revelation is an integral part of the Bible. If we would take a chapter out of uh, the book of Revelation, we have taken it away from the Bible because the book of Revelation is an integral part of the book, the Bible. And so no matter how you cut it, when it's talking about this book, it is talking about the Bible. But the problem is, these individuals have set up their own kind of a gospel. They have selected certain verses that they like very much, and they believe they can harmonize these things, uh, harmonize the truths in these verses as they understand them, and they believe that those verses are from God, and therefore they're trustworthy. And then, based on that, they develop their theology or their kind of a gospel. And every church does that. But the, the, uh, it's utter foolishness because the only uh, gospel that is true and trustworthy is the whole Bible. And we have to constantly examine whatever we believe against the whole Bible and, and make sure that it's harmonizing with the whole Bible. Otherwise, we're going to have a defective gospel that will not bring salvation. It will bring a man-made kind of a salvation program, which is characteristic of church after church. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Um, I just wanted to bring something to your attention. Um, I received a, um, an audio Bible from, from Family Radio uh, probably about a year ago or so, and um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have. And I just recently sent away for uh, one for my family, and uh, when my mom got it, she went to play it. It seems like it's not formatted or something uh, correctly where, you know, the, the one I have, you can you can skip from book to book and chapter to chapter, and the one she has... Um, you can't you can't skip around from book to book. You you kind of have to, um, you know what I mean. To get like through the book of Genesis, you have to forward all the way through individually each chapter. I don't know if that really makes sense, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the technology there or the details of that. I can sp uh, speak to whoever uh, had something to do about that and ask them questions, but I'm not qualified at all to give you any kind of an answer right now. Okay, I just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention because, sure. um, like I said, it seems like it's just not formatted correctly. Um, if, you know, if, uh, if you guys, you know, find out and get the problem fixed, would it be okay if I sent away for another one in a few weeks or so? Well, sure. If, 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 uh, but, but first of all, communicate to make sure that there is a problem. I, I mean, I'm, I'm totally ignorant of, <laughs> unable to comment, so I, I can't help you. I understand. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Campin? Yes. Uh, allow me to turn my radio down, please. Yes, please do. Thank you. Uh, Brother Camping, uh, could you turn to Hebrews, uh, the first chapter of Hebrews? Hebrews 1, and which verse? Uh, 1 and 2. 
Let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times, that is different times, and diverse manners, that is in different manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Yes, I was listening to the gentleman that was calling you earlier about uh, this guy was having different interpretations, you know, about how God was speaking, and I thought this would be a great scripture for him that God, you know, speaks to us by his Son, which is the Word of God. Would that be correct? Yeah, well, you, uh, yeah, what is that? What, do you have a question about these two No, verses? I was just making a comment, oh. you know, to help him out. Oh, I see. Well, in, in here, of course, God is simply uh, indicating uh, that God is the, and the Son of God are one and the same, are they not? Mm-hmm. Uh, because Christ is God. But mm-hmm. uh, hold on. We're, we're, we're going to have to pause for just a moment for a message, and I'll, I'll okay. get right back to you. Hold on. All right. Our attention has been called uh, uh, to a couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 1 by a listener we have on the line, where in the first verse, God is indicating that in the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets unto our fathers. That is, the Old Testament, we find that uh, that God actually dictated the uh, what he wanted the world to hear and what became a part of the Bible to various prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Moses and so on. And so we have the Word of God. Then, in these last days, and the last days refer to the whole New Testament era, Christ himself, who is God, came and spoke directly. We hear words flowing right out of his mouth as we read Uh, about his uh, statements in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, although uh, the rest of the New Testament also is uh, simply the same idea as the Old Testament, that that, uh, uh, when Paul spoke or when Peter uh, wrote and so on, it was God who was giving them the message in the same way that he gave Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah and so on. But then in verse 3, God tells us how great and wonderful this Christ is. Uh, who, in, first, in fact, in the last part of verse 2, he says, By whom, speaking about Christ now, by whom also he made the worlds. In other words, Christ is the creator. And that also identifies with many other verses in the Bible. And then he speaks further about how glorious this Christ is, this Son of God, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, that identifies like what we read in, uh, with what we read in Colossians, that in him dwelleth all the the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then he goes on, and who, and upholding all things by the word of his power. My, my, God is in, Christ is infinite God who holds the whole world, the whole universe. And uh, then it talks about uh, the fact that he, was that he took care of our sins. He cleansed those who he came to save of their sins. By it's talking about the fact that he is the Savior, and now he is reigning from heaven at the right hand of God. Again, a mystery. How can God be one person and yet be sitting at the right hand of God? It's all a, a, a mystery. But but you see, these verses are really declaring the wonder and the importance and the glory of Christ. A oh, quick question, if I may, Brother Camping. Uh, yeah. Revelation, the third chapter. The Re- Revelation, the first chapter? No, Re- Revelation, the third chapter. The third chapter, yes. Yes, uh, verse um, 20 to 21. And I'll take my question off of the air. Is that talking about a lady preaching in the church when it yeah, says Jezebel? In Revelation 3, verse 20 and 21? Oh, I'm sorry, Revelation 2. Oh, Revelation 2. Yes. Verse 21, 21 and 22. No, 20 and 21. 20 and 21. Correct. No, this is, well, 
uh, this is talking about, well, let's read it first a moment. And it's talking, he's using the church at Thyatira that existed before the Bible was even completed, okay. one of the early churches, as an illustration of how bad things would become in churches all over the world as time progressed. And so he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because they, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, and, and he, God is picking a name, a person from the Old Testament who was notorious for her wickedness. She was the queen who ruled with King Ahab over Israel. Uh, and she was a notoriously wicked woman, killing all the prophets, which called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Well, now he's talking about anything that is going contrary to the will of God. Certainly there's a direct a relationship to the fact that uh, there are women preaching in churches all over the world. I just got a letter from... Uh, Nigeria, where this individual is complaining that most of the pastors in his area are women and totally in rebellion against God. And, and any time we are in rebellion, we are like the woman Jezebel. You know, uh, the Bible typifies the church as a woman, as a woman. And, and, uh, and that's why God uses a woman's name here. Jezebel, but any church, whatever their rebellion is, as they set up their own kind of a gospel, become akin or become uh, identified with this wicked woman, Jezebel, and for the, the, the fact of women preaching in the churches is just one more sin piled up upon a whole lot of other rebellious sins that are found in the local congregations of our day. Thank you very much, Brother Captain. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. I have two questions. Um, one is regarding, it's an interesting statement where God is talking about um, Satan's house being divided. And he goes into uh, Matthew 3.24, if a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. I, I'm sorry, your voice is too low. Can you speak right? Sure, sure. Phone? In Matthew 3.24, it talks about if a kingdom is divided against itself. Oh, uh, uh, a kingdom, kingdom cannot, cannot exist. A kingdom divided against itself cannot exist. Yeah, so uh, what I'm curious about is since Satan is the abomination of desolation and he's taken his place in the temple, and he is becoming the representation, uh, the false representation of what's holy, and at the same time his kingdom exists uh, in the wicked outside of the church. And I'm curious if that, you know, if Matthew 3.24 has more meaning to it, uh, because Satan is not only dictating. Um, you know, supposed spiritual authority uh, in a false way. He's also um, instituting wickedness outside of the church. Does that make sense? Well, the fact is that we know that God has appointed Satan to, uh, uh, to be the chief ruler in all the congregations. But that doesn't mean now we have harmony between all the congregations. Uh, there's there's all kinds of fighting and bickering between denominations and so on, but it's the same way he is also loosed in the world uh, to prepare the world for wicked, for Judgment Day. And are we seeing harmony out there in the world? The answer is absolutely not. We're seeing people killing off each other and nations fighting against nations. Uh, it isn't it isn't like it is the kingdom of God uh, that is being destroyed by the kingdom of Satan, it is Satan's kingdom itself that is is in eternal uh, destruction as, uh, or is in continuing destruction as there is uh, uh, people killing off 
uh, their own, and uh, uh, and this is the this is the uh, this is the nature of sin. It is self-destructive altogether. Self-destructive. I guess um, is that why um, Mark three twenty four. I'm kind of curious about it's a it's kind of an interesting fulfillment of a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand and. I'm wondering about, you know, the significance of that particular phrase in the Bible because it holds true. It's as if, you know, Satan, uh, in some respect, is imploding. That is, you know, he rules from the church, dictating some type of false spiritual authority. Are, are, you're, while... not, are you're not talking about Matthew 3.24. No, I'm talking about, I'm, excuse me, I'm talking about Mark 3.24. Oh, Mark 3.24. Yeah. Let's look at that a minute. I'd like I like to see the context there. Mark three twenty four. We read uh, uh, in verse twenty two, uh, where the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, "He hath Beelzebub talking about the Lord Jesus, mm-hmm. and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils." And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, what that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself, and he divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. Now, he's not saying that there is that Satan is divided against himself, uh, Satan will not stand because he's under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God. But if, if uh, he's explaining that that uh, uh, they are accusing Christ, we have to look at the context. They are accusing Christ of having, uh, 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 being under the power of Satan, and yet Christ came to to destroy Satan. And so if that would mean that he would be divided, Satan would be divided against himself, and the whole mission of Christ would fail altogether. Uh, and so, uh, but uh, the fact is that that uh, Satan is not against himself, although because of the nature of sin, there is a lot of self-destruction going on. But, but uh, it's not, first of all, that it's divided against itself. God is simply uh, indicating that no. So there, it's impossible for Christ to have been under the power of Satan because then Christ's whole, uh, whole work would not stand at all. I guess and it, it brought me to that um, reflection of, you know, here it is, and we know at the end of time that Satan will take his seat and will uh, produce false gospels that are misleading, and, um, you know, and... His ministers will come as ministers of righteousness. Yeah, well, um, the fact... Told, what, what, what would happen is, you know, and then he, I guess in the world, they're always looking for um, a moral compass. And it, I find it ironic that he, he is able to sit uh, in, in his place in the temple dictating false righteousness uh, in the world as if he's giving people in the world hope but at the same time, he facilitates uh, the wickedness and escalates sin at the same time. So I've always thought that's a curious predicament for both him and the unsaved. Well, he certainly comes as the great deceiver and as a counterfeit Christ, and that's where the, the uh, trap is, and that's why we have, are so glad that we have the whole Bible that we can follow to check these things out. But thank you thank for you. calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campion. Yes. Hi. Um, I have some questions um, regarding um, your the timeline that you use uh, from Genesis um, regarding uh, what you call the progenitors. Uh, from Genesis uh, 5. Yes. Um, the question I have, if we look in Matthew 1, um, verse 2, and we look at the example given uh, where um, uh, Abraham begat Isaac, and, uh, and Isaac begat Jacob, and um, 
um, it lists in um, Matthew 1 that there, are, there were 14 generations up to David and then 14 generations from David to the taking away to Babylon and uh, another 14 generations from the coming away from Babylon to Christ. If we look at the word used there um, as begat, um, I know the, the New Testament is written in Greek. Are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm following okay. you. And so uh, we, we have a variance from the, the Greek, which I believe is geneho, I believe in the Greek, which translates to bear uh, child. And, and if we go back and reference in First Chronicles um, 134, we, we look at, um, it's listed there, that's repeated in the Old Testament. It says, Abraham begat Isaac. Okay. But that's written in the Hebrew. Well, what is the point you're trying to well, make? Well, I'm, I'm trying to understand how you, um, it, it seems to me that the timeline you're using takes into account um, uh, um, a listing from Genesis 5 as not necessarily being um, from, say, Seth to Enos. Yeah, you see, the problem is, and I, there's no way that I can uh, get into all of this in detail in this program because, it's uh, first of all, it's been uh, too long ago that I have really worked on this, but that we do know this, that we, first of all, have to start with comparing Scripture with Scripture. We have right. to take all the information that is available. Now, as we do this, we do find certain evidence in the Bible that uh, f from time to time it's speaking about a father and his immediate son. Right. There's all kinds of language that indicates that Abraham mm -hmm. begat Isaac as yep. an immediate son. Right. We find that Isaac begat Jacob as an immediate son. No question about Correct. that. We find that Solomon begat uh, uh, Nathan, and, and or, or excuse me, that David begat Solomon and begat Nathan as immediate sons. We, we do uh, find that direct evidence. But on the other hand, we also find many times where there is no... No biblical clue that indicates the word begat, uh, which means the progenitor of, uh, that, that it's an immediate son or a grandson or a great-grandson or a great-grandson. There's no clue of any kind. And therefore, at that point, we have to say, well, then we don't know whether that was an immediate son, and it could be uh, a grandson or a great-grandson or a great-great-grandson. And then we have to find other information as to how we are to work through this. Now, the fact that God uses the word generation, that is not a clue of any kind, because God uses the word generation in a very broad way. For example, he says... Uh, in, in, in the Gospels, he says, this generation, the same word, will not pass away until all these things be accomplished. Right. And what generation is he talking about? The whole generation of evil that, uh, that embraces 13,000 years of history. Uh, that generation is, is the uh, whole duration of mankind on earth. And so the word generation is not a clue. Now, there are a lot of theologians who look, see the word generation, and right away they think of maybe 40 years. No basis for that of any kind. That is simply a speculation on their part. And so, uh, all of this requires very, very careful analysis of all these names as they're found in the Bible, and that's why uh, uh, if, if you look at the book, Time Has an End, I did work through this and very, very carefully. And, and, uh, and then, then when you get all done and you work out the, the calendar of history, then you back up and see what's now. Have we any proofs? Is there any way we can uh, see what's see if this all hangs together? Right. And there are certain ways we can right. uh, develop that to some degree. Well, I, I, I'm... I'm um, I'm trying to be in agreement with you on things, and and um, I I was called 
what I consider being called to God a decade ago, and I sought out God in the church, in many, many, many churches, and I felt I was unable to find God in the church. And I believe that that goes along with what uh, you find in the Bible. Um, and I'm just I'm trying to uh, be in agreement with um, the timelines that you're giving for um, Judgment Day coming, and I run across things that I can't explain myself, and I am hard-pressed to understand exactly how you come up with your timeline. So maybe I should... Um, well, you say it's explained in the book that you've written. Yeah, well, and maybe I should read that for more information. Well, uh, absolutely. You see, that is why I wrote, those books were written. They were not written uh, because it's, this is a very simple truth. That wouldn't take a whole book. That could take a little tiny pamphlet. But the fact is that that uh, that uh, there's a lot of information that has to be fit that has to fit in right. and you get a little piece here and a little piece there and then you have to find harmony between all of those pieces mm -hmm. and so i laid it all out so that so that those who are very careful and, and very concerned about this they can check it out they can they can actually uh, find uh, look at the same verses and look at the same conclusions and make their own decision was a correct conclusion arrived at and and that's why i wrote it out in very uh, great detail so that uh, uh, rather than just make a statement that uh, that uh, uh, you know i work through the bible and i found out that Creation occurred in 11,013 B.C. It's very complex. I'm not going to tell you how I got there, but I know I've got the truth. Okay, no well, way. I, no I mean, way. Just, just from the, the layman's point, I'm, I mean, I have great respect for the years that you studied the Bible. And um, I have just... Um, well, I, talk I about the time coming to an end. That's a very profound statement. Well, I would suggest that you get the book, Time Has an End. Okay. And read it. Uh, there's an enormous amount of material there, and don't trust me at all. But, no, I, uh, but I look at those Bible. verses. Look, read the verses. Read what is said about them, and see: uh, have, have I misstepped someplace? Have I am I fudging somewhere? Because man, the last thing I don't want to fudge. You know, there's one thing about Bible truth. There's absolutely no advantage in fudging or trying to make something come out just so that you look good because we're dealing with time and eternity. We're dealing with heaven and hell. And we're dealing with the Word of God. And therefore, per, uh, personal pride or ego better not get in the way at all. And so uh, that's why I am so thrilled to be on a program like the Open Forum, where anybody can, uh, and they're, they're, the, these books are out there, and they can read those books, and, and they can uh, critique them, and write in the public marketplace, they can say, Camping, you said thus and thus and thus, and it won't wash because there's a verse over here that you didn't take into account. And if they can show that, I couldn't be happier than to be corrected because the Bible is given for correction, and, and I learn from other people also. And, but I'll tell you, uh, it's uh, it's uh, what what God has opened up does not come easily. It does require lots and lots of careful study. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kimming. How are you doing? Yes, very well. Thank you. Turn my radio down a little bit. Trying to get you for a long time. Okay, uh, in Revelation, it talks about the great whore. Yeah. Okay, I believe that's 16, you know, 2 through 5. Okay, all through the Bible, the harlot has been named, correct? All through the Bible, the harlot is, Nash, is Israel, whether it's national Israel or the Israel of the church age, that is setting up their own kind of a gospel claiming that they are following the Word of God, 
but actually simply choosing from the Word of God what they like and then building their own theology around it. That's what makes them a harlot because they are really setting up their own God claiming that it is Christ that is their God uh, that is uh, that is the one whom they are following. Okay, so uh, like in Proverbs, it talks about a prostitute's trap, you know, and the, and the harlot. And then in Nahum, chapter 3, verse 4, it talks about because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft that sells nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. Now, is that... Speaking of a, a physical harlot or a spiritual harlot, or is that the nation of Israel? No, it's all spiritual harlot. You see, uh, the uh, uh, in the Old Testament, God was married spiritually to national Israel. Right. Was married spiritually to national Israel, and and yet every time they set their own rules up they were engaging in spiritual harlotry. It was like they are, are going after another husband, another god uh, right. to uh, follow. And so that's why they were called a harlot. And they are a picture or portrait of the New Testament church that also every time they change uh, or, or set up a, a creed or a doctrine, that was contrary to the Word of God, and there's plenty of them that they have that are contrary to the Word of God. That is an act of going after another God. So they, too, are typified as a spiritual harlot. Now, now God also uses, though, the, the harlot, or correct me if I'm wrong, whoredom or harlotry kind of stems from the word porneia, correct? Like nakedness or filthiness in well, the Greek? Well, nakedness or is is identified with harlotry because, right. uh, of course, nakedness has to do with with uh, sexual misconduct and right. and so. So on. he does picture, he does use the physical woman who is a whore to liken that to us in a spiritual way, so that we might understand the whoredoms of the great whore. I mean, like today. You know, in today's world, in the physical world, there's a rise in women that are going outside of the proper way, not under the men anymore, but they're going out getting jobs. They're doing their own thing. They yeah. get their own their own finances, their own clothes, their own thing, and they don't need a man. Yeah, but no, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, God right. is not particularly pointing out that particular sin, although that obviously is grievous sin. But when we read about harlotry in the Bible, invariably we have to remember that Christ spoke in parables. The whole Bible is an er giving an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. And so invariably that harlotry has to do with rebellion against the law of God. And it's not dealing in the first instance at all about uh, about physical harlotry, although that also is a grievous sin in the eyes of God, and and that that is included amongst all the sins that are named. But now I have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.